for those watching, this is what we look like when we've just dropped the anchor and run around the boat doing stuff, getting ready to record. I've got not my, pretty. Got my sweat rag ready. Got the same old crap I've been wearing for the last two days. Desperately need to wash, desperately need to shower. And I put my leopard Alice band in. You look very pretty. Well, it's just to, you know, to give those watching a little bit of a, you know, bit of respect. <laughs> We've got matching tops on as well. well we have, haven't we? Yes, That's our Uniglow, Uniglow tops. These are really good when you're sailing because they dry quickly. That's right. Uh, yeah. But what we should say is welcome to what is, in my opinion, possibly the most beautiful anchorage in the world. Are we going to say what it is? No. Why not? No, because uh, we'll find out in a few weeks in the vlog. But okay. what I was going to say was not only is it the prettiest anchorage in the world, but it's also one of the most dangerous. It is quite dangerous, yes. And those that know us could probably work out exactly where we are. It's not that difficult. No. But by dangerous, we don't mean from a natural point of view. We've been in far more dangerous anchorages. Yes, Krakatoa. Like Krakatoa, exactly, yes. One mile away from a volcano that had erupted only a few months previous. No, this is more dangerous from a security point of view. And that is why we're not mentioning where we are, because we have to keep it stum. OK, but the only thing I would say today is, hold on, going to tell everybody when we're recording this, is 22nd, it's uh, 1.57. Uh, that's that's 1.57 in the afternoon on Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday. Know. Tuesday. Yes, Tuesday is the day we will record. So by the time this goes out on Thursday, we'll have got through all the dangerous bits. So we could we actually say. I think next week. <laughs> I think next week okay. when, when we are in nice, safe anchorage and everything's all cool. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006, and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel, or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. So... At least we're at anchor. There will be no planes here, that's for sure. There might be some boats going past because there are tourist boats that come from mainland. And Bajau Laut. So we've got the Bajau Laut just round the corner. Explain Bajau Laut to those uh, that have never heard of them. Yes, of course. Sea gypsies, as, yes. they're, as they're known. And these are the, well, some people call them stateless. Mm. They're on Malaysian territory, but really they are people of the sea. Yes. They have kind of existed for hundreds of years, flitting between the Filipino, neighbouring Filipino islands and the islands around Sabah. And that is how they have existed for, for many, many years. Pre before Malaysia existed as a country, they have been living in this area. Indeed, and, and before the Philippines. And uh, politicians declare countries countries and, did, and fight over borders and do all of that. But all of that is actually irrelevant to them because they just live their lives that they have for centuries, as you say. And they just sadly get caught between three countries here, Malaysia, Indonesia and Philippines, all fighting over bits of sea that they've lived in for a long time. And so they are kind of stateless over here. There are lots of them in Indonesia and lots of them in Philippines as well. That's right. And they're, and they're dotted all around these beautiful anchorages that we're at. I mean, th let's face it, they have some of the prettiest settings if you're going to live anywhere. Some of the spots they have in among the reefs of these gorgeous tropical islands. Uh, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard existence, I think. Be because they're stateless, of course, they don't get any of the benefits from being, you know, from holding a Malaysian passport or a Filipino passport. Uh, but going back to your point, they do shoot around occasionally in their little speed yes, boats. Yes, we don't worry about them. No. Don't, we don't, we're not really worried at all. We, it is a dangerous spot, but there are plenty of police boats around, so we're all right. Yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about that properly next week. Um, I wanted to say that it's been eight days since the last recording, mm -hmm. and we've made a massive 250 miles. Yes. Why only 250 miles in eight days? Do you want to explain? <laughs> well, it goes back to the security thing and the fact that, you know, 270 miles or whatever it is, isn't much in sailing terms. But 
we are only allowed to move between dawn and dusk. Yes, yeah, so we're not allowed to sail at night. Correct. Um, which means it's had to be day hops and they have vary between 30 odd up to 50 odd depending on yeah. whatever. And we stayed in one place for a bit longer than we had anticipated <laughs> because we had a problem on Esper. We did. Once again, Esper holds everyone up. Mm. This is what happened on the Saba rally we did. We managed to hold the rally up for a day when we had a technical problem. We held the rally up in the middle of the sea, right on the Filipino border, when yes. our rope stripper, which is the mechanism on your prop shaft that's supposed to rip up any rope that you might get caught around your prop, um, I had to disassemble that underwater, so we held the rally up there. So we're getting quite a reputation, I think, for holding boats up, aren't yes. we? Yes, I mean, this one was um, a, a big one, and we will mm. we, we have blogged properly about it, and it will be appearing on a video, but just to, to let people know, it involved rigging, and that's something that you can't, you can't leave, can you? That's we right. had to deal with it. We had to deal with it, and I'm glad we found it when we did, because we happened to have been in a location where we could get it temporarily fixed. It's mm. not a per perfect fix, but I'm just glad we were able to do the fix that we did mm. where we did it. Because mm. if it had happened two days later, we mm. would have been really stuck. And as you say, it was pretty significant. Mm. Yeah, well, we won't tease people about that anymore. There is, uh, you know, this is the thing. It's one of the reasons I, I'm ambivalent about sailing with other boats. On the one hand, it's good because you've got people there kind of looking out for you and if you've got a problem you can work together you know you can use other people bounce off ideas you were able to talk to Ian on Icy Red and uh, it was good to have someone to bounce the ideas mm. off with other, rather than me just looking in a book uh, that's all good what I don't like is deadlines and being told you've got to be somewhere and inflexibility because had we been doing this journey on our own, which we may have done, who knows, there are places we would have stayed longer, like here, mm -hmm. and perhaps a different route we might have taken. Um, you know, so I'm really not good with being <laughs> with groups of boats. You'd probably say groups of people, but... I think you're right. How do, yeah. I think... We haven't talked about this to each other. No, so we, we are what you'd say, we are not rally people. Definitely not. And the only two rallies we've done at both happened to coincide with the problems of piracy. Yes. And those were the main reasons why we did the rallies. Well, let's be honest, they're the only reasons we did yeah. rallies. We wouldn't otherwise do a rally, would we? No. And, and this is the same. I mean, this isn't a rally. This is kind of self-organised. But I think the problem that we have here is this communication that we have to have with ESCOM, mm. which is the security, uh, combined security forces, uh, which monitor and control the traffic around the Malaysian waters. And, you know, Sharon and Lindsay have taken on the responsibility of communicating with ESCOM for this little group, which actually they did in the rally as well. So they're, they're getting quite good at it. But I'm sure there's probably lots of conversations they are having with ESCOM that we don't know about where ESCOM are saying, you have a fixed amount of time that you can spend at this anchorage. We're in oh, my favourite anchorage. I would love to spend three days here. And because our visas are all now sorted, we have time to. But I suspect behind closed doors, there's probably conversations going on saying you can't spend any longer here than you know. OK, than you'd and like so to. this is this is my this is one of my concerns because originally we weren't going to have any kind of escort. It was out of the blue. So on the one hand, fantastic mm. to have an escort. Weren't expecting that. It's just like being on the rally. Mm. So that's great. But it, that does suddenly start put, you know, reducing your freedoms a bit. I know they're doing it for a reason. It's, it's so that you don't get robbed and pillaged or, or taken hostage or something. But on the other hand, had it been just us, we could have made those decisions and we would have been having the conversation with ESCOM ourselves. Now, we wouldn't have had an escort, just one boat, but we would have been in touch with them. Um, we, we, I mean, luckily for us, we, we know Sharon and Lindsay and we're used to them being the leaders, if you like, a leader, loose term, meaning the one boat that talks to ESCOM out of a group of five because it's easier for ESCOM to talk to just one boat mm -hmm. than to talk to each of us individually. Although having said that, 
at every anchorage we go to, the boats come and talk to each individual boat. And you've mm -hmm. had quite a few VHF conversations with them as well. So anyway, I'm just, you know, you know me, I'm just irritable about having to do things I don't want to do. <laughs> well, I think you're just irritable generally because normally when we do these podcasts, it's first thing in the morning after we've just had our coffee, but we've just done a passage and just because we're so short of time, this is the one opportunity we have to get out this week's podcast and, and because it's after a passage, I think we're both a little bit tired, we've had a bit too much sun. Thank you, sir. We, we had a cracking sail today and, yes. and that's the great thing for the, you know, this last week we've been getting some great sailing in, which of course you'll see in the vlogs. Obviously still motoring as well, bit of motor sailing, um, but just today we pretty much sailed the whole way, which is just glorious. Yeah, that was good. At the beginning we didn't get much, but then you reach a point at which the winds change mm. and, the, and the currents and everything changes and the, and the sailing is, is good. Mm. So that, that has been good. Uh, it's always good to sail. Um, so the rest of the, uh, anything else you want to say about what's happened over the last week? The one thing I do want to talk about, obviously, is fishing. Of course you do. <laughs> because we caught a lovely albacore on the way up to the beginning of this little venture. And uh, since then, we've caught two uh, rather large mackerels. Mm. And, well, I say we, I catch, you dispatch. It's a joint effort. Um, so they were great. So the first mackerel lasted two and a half days. Then we had a break and then we caught another one. Uh, and that's, we're on day two of that and that's going to last tomorrow as well. So I'm quite careful to just fish f fish that we need. Once we've filled the fridge, the freezer and eaten, stop. Get the fish and stop. But I could have done with one today. I didn't get one today. Never mind. <laughs> now, you mentioned the freezer. And mm. of course, this is something we've alluded to in the past. We now have this portable freezer with its new jacket. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll get a glimpse of that in next week's vlog. But that Frida, Fr Frida? Freezer? Who's Frida? Frida. Oh, she's some young girl some I'm bird. seeing on the side. <laughs> It's been a godsend, isn't it? And yeah, it has. that combined with your vacuum sealer, yes. which you're also going to see in this Sunday's yes. episode, um, the combination of those two means that you can do a little bit more fishing than you normally would. For example, in two days' time, we're going to have to sit at anchor for four days. Yes. And we won't be able to fish around there. But if we've got a couple of extra mackerel in the freezer, vacuum sealed, then. Well, um, yes, I'm going to do my best over the next, uh, so we've got tomorrow and the day after to get there. So I'll have the lines out the whole time. I don't know why I didn't get anything today. I need to think about that. Of course, the other, the other thing that happened is that before we left KK, I went to the best fishing shop in town and restocked on lots of things. And one of them was um, a whole new 1,500 yards of monofilament and re-spooled both my reels on my rods. And couldn't understand why I lost a lure. I haven't lost a lure for years. I mean, I don't know, about eight years ago I lost a lure. And that, that was because it got caught around a fish, fish trap. But we pulled a barracuda up, didn't know what to do with it. We didn't want to. We were trying to decide what, if we could take the hook out and get it back in the water, free it. And uh, the line just snapped. Lost that, lost the lure. And then yesterday... Um, what was I doing? Oh yes, we were going through uh, quite a odd turmoil-y sea, weren't we? And all of a sudden, uh, there was something on the line, it went mad, I tried pulling in, it was so stiff, and I pulled and pulled, and bang, again, the line snapped. Anyway, long story short, long story long, the line I bought is bloody useless. Now, my guess was that this monofilament you bought, I think you were probably one of the first customers after lockdown when this fishing shop opened. And that monofilament's probably been sitting on his shelf for the last two years in the sun, slowly degrading. And, and in fact, you looked it up afterwards, didn't you? And, and mono does degrade over time. Yeah, I did. I read that you shouldn't really buy it. If it's over two or three years old, don't buy it. But it was all wrapped up. You know, it never occurred to me to test the line before you buy it. So that was 180 ringgit down the drain. I mean, literally, as I w was tying the knot to the new lure, having lost the second lure, I just tightened it and, you know, it just broke in my hand. So it's completely degraded. I am lucky, though, that I do hoard all my fishing gear. So I do have some up my sleeve that I can use in the meantime until we get to the next place where I'm going to go to the, another fishing shop. Anyway, so that's the tale of my sad... Yeah. 
I mean, and even I feel annoyed. for you. Normally your fishing tales bore me, oh, stupid, no. but this one I really felt for you because you'd spent so much time and effort <laughs> putting these rigs together with beautiful knots. And yeah, it's uh, it was a bit disappointing, but hey, the fish that you did catch have just been... And, and this is the great thing, you know, now that we're back in this cruising mode again, yes. we're now our diets are back to cruising mode diet. And, and this is my favourite because... You know, we, we can't nip to the local restaurant and feed up on pizza. We can't go to the supermarket and buy jellies and sweets and chocolates. We are now back on rice, fish and what vegetables we carry. And this diet, combined with all the exercise, hopefully losing a few pounds as well, is it's just brilliant. And we've been sleeping so well as well. We always sleep well at anchor, don't mm. we? So much better than a marina. Well, yes, yeah, sometimes. Unless it's a really bad rolly one with some bad weather yeah we had a bit of a squall the other <laughs> night and i i was up now actually it was one of the safest anchorages you could be in but uh i did wake up in the middle of the night i'm a light sleeper you're a snorer i didn't even hear that squall it's a yeah. bit of a worry isn't it i just slept straight through it yeah. apparently you were opening and closing hatches and things i didn't hear a thing no no <laughs> But anyway, this lifestyle, we're fully back into this cruising lifestyle and it yeah. has just been a pleasure. And in fact, Mike Hayes, I think it was, uh, said last week, congrats on getting to Anchor. And uh, thank you, Mike. That's This one's for you. This is all about being at Anchor yes. and cruising yes. once more. Well, this is what it's going to be all about the next few months, hopefully, mm. on both our podcasts and on our main videos. The one thing, nothing to do with any of this, that I did want to mention is that we had Storm Eunice over in the UK this week. And obviously, you know, family and friends are over there. And we're actually quite worried for them at one stage, weren't we? Mm. Because it looked really bad. Have you seen all that uh, footage? Mm. Shocker. Yeah. The last time we had that was 87, of course. Yeah. And, and a few people died dis despite yeah. being warned not to go out. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a big one. But I... Obviously, we thought about our family and friends on land, but can you imagine being at, at sea or one of those, well, being on a commercial ship going up the English Channel? Because I think the English Channel actually got the brunt of it. That was the worst hit because the fastest speed they found on the needles on the Isle of Wight, yeah, which is Wight, right yes. in the, I think it was 120 odd miles yeah, or something. Fastest recorded? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, 122. Really bad. I mean, I did speak to Salty Lass. Um, who also have a sailing YouTube channel, they're based in the UK, and I says, how was it, guys? You know, uh, haven't heard much about what happened to yachts over there. Mm. And they did say that where they were was fine. I can't remember exactly where they Do you remember? They are, are they up towards the Isle of Man? I can't remember where they are at the moment. Anyway, but they weren't where it was bad. But they have heard tale of many shredded uh, sails and yachts that were bashed around over there. So, mm. yeah, thoughts are with uh, everyone in the UK who are just about to have, or have just had another one. Bless them. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon or join us on FTB Mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. We want to talk about two things. We want to talk about uh, the video that went up on Sunday night, which was all about, what was it all about? It was something that didn't interest me. <laughs> <laughs> it was you doing ba batteries. maintenance. Yeah. Lithium oh, batteries. Right. Now, here's the funny thing. The lithium battery episode has, to this date, for this year, been our most viewed episode. And yet it received the fewest comments. Weird, isn't and it? And I just don't get this. I mean, this is just typical YouTube algorithm, isn't it? It's very, very odd. But anyway, obviously the people that uh, watched it uh, were interested. We got a few comments on, you know, some ideas, suggestions, the usual thing. Um, but if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. But ultimately it was a failure. It didn't work. Oh. And that was because one of the cells we received was faulty. Uh, now, Daniel Warden, who frequently comments, yeah. uh, he said, oh, no, what an anti-climax, expecting... He, I think he said something along the lines of, when I think of lithium batteries, I think of explosions on aeroplanes. Yeah. Um, and for those who don't know, there is a difference in the chemical structure of a lithium-ion battery, I-O-N, mm. and a lithium-iron phosphate, I-R-O-N. They are slightly different. 
So the ones you have on your phone which have been known to explode are lithium ion. Mm -hmm. These are a little bit different. I right. can see you're already switching Glazing off. over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, so, but what Daniel did say was, does this mean you go on three quarters power? Now, I wasn't sure if he meant, do we only use three of the four cells? Now, of course, you can't do that because these are 3.5 volt cells. So you need four of them in order to make up 12 volts. So if one cell has gone, yes. it means that you're only left with nine plus volts. Which is why it was so disappointing that one cell didn't work, because right. we're all geared up to have all this extra power. Yep. Uh, so... Yeah, I was worried that we wouldn't be able to use the freezer. So far, so good, though. I was going to say, I mean, if nothing else, this is the, the great thing is, is that uh, it's proved that we can run the freezer on our current setup without these additional batteries. That said, don't forget, at the moment, we are running the engine every day mm. to weigh anchor, sometimes motor sailing. Uh, we have glorious sunshine, so it's keeping the solar panels topped up. Mm. I think it will be a different story when we come to Beer Tank and we have lots of cloudy days. Or at any length of time in one place without, you know, with... with yeah, but then, then we just get our generator out and of course that's yeah. been serviced, so, you know, it's not a yeah. big deal. But, yeah, so the good thing is, is that these new batteries I was trying to install, they weren't essential. Yes. They were just nice to have. Yes, I don't think people realised that. Yeah. I don't think that came across. So it was an addition. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, not the end of the world. In fact, what you did then was you sent them back. I mean, not all of them, sorry. You sent that the cell back, mm -hmm. the dodgy one. But it had to go by sea because you can't put them in an aeroplane. That's right. Despite the fact that they're not dangerous. Yes. Actually, that was uh, that was commented on by a couple of people. Uh, someone else, I've got the notes here. We, had, we got so many comments, by the yeah. way. We can't go through them all. But someone did say, I'm glad you told me that things have to be shipped by sea because he had just bought a camera from Japan and it, had, it was taking ages. And this is one of the problems when electronic items with batteries are shipped, it can take a lot longer because they are sea freighted. Mm. Funnily enough, though, the vendor received the battery quite quickly. Okay. He got it within two weeks. Has he said he's going to replace it yet? Nope. Right. You need to be chasing that up. I right? have. Right. I have chased it up and I've chased up with the, through the platform that we bought it through. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I've received no reply. Now, of course, we can't do much about it anyway because we're not at the postal location now. But uh, I will c continue to pursue it. But it's disappointing, isn't it? Not only do you get a faulty cell, but the fact that the vendor hasn't replied, he hasn't said he sent out a new one. But anyway... It's well, not. he better bloody do that, but otherwise, you know, it's a lot of money down the bloody drain and of we can't it afford is. it. So of course, yes. Get on the case, man. Yeah, <laughs> on it, on it. So that was the, that was the episode that went out on Sunday. That oh. was, that, was that 290 or was that 289? I'm 290. Confused. So that was 290. So the next one that you're working on now, 291. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so that... I think, <laughs> I think, so. I think that's I right. I don't know, I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, so... Not much else to say on the batteries from my point of view, other than damned annoyed. Anyway, there we go. By the way, I should just explain, in that episode you saw a light bulb at one point. Yes. And it, I didn't really explain, I put an overlay on the screen explaining uh, trying to balance the cells. So with lithium batteries, you have an option to either top balance or bottom balance your cells. And what this means is you need to get the voltage of each cell at the same point so that when you eventually connect them in series to make your 12 volts, they're all charging at the same rate. And that trick with the light bulb is a classic way of draining a battery, albeit a very slow way of doing it. But if you connect a light bulb to a battery and just leave it connected, that very slowly pulls down the voltage. So what you saw me trying to do in the video was actually pulling down the voltage of each cell to, I think it was 3.27 volts, because that was the lowest of the cells, that was the lowest cell. So I was trying to get them all to 3.27 before then connecting them all up to then charge together. And I was able to do that. And that's when I proved that there was a problem with the cell, the one cell that was overcharging. Yeah. So people might be wondering why, how we think we're going to get a replacement because we're leaving the country. But the plan is to get back to mm. KK at some point, mm. depending on visas, as usual, yep. and kind of where we go next. But later in the year, the ideas will come back and then be able to pick up the replacement. Right. So I'm going to 
now leave that episode behind unless there's anything else you want to say um and there's so many comments now coming in on the podcast immediately and throughout the week and then you get comments on previous podcasts so i want to make half of our output now dealing with the comments and the messages that we get from everybody. Well, this, this is listener and viewer generated content, basically, yeah. which is yes. what we were after. Yes, that, that's it, exactly. It's a two-way thing, the podcast. We, we don't just preach and talk at people. We want to hear what they have to say. So, obviously, the last one we did was all it was about lots of things, but the selling Esper was the, was the tit- title of it. And... My word, what a response we got to that. It was a resounding no, don't sell her. Uh, apart from Johan van Heerden, who would like us to sell it to him for a dollar. <laughs> Before we talk about that, could I just yeah. go to a, just a general one. I wanted to mention Dallas Powie. And um, this is a new, she says, or, sorry, he, could be he, I'm not sure. Uh, they say they're a new viewer. You are great, they say. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. So fun and entertaining. Love the accents. Americans so like to hear what we might sound like if we hadn't rebelled. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's right. I did see that. Oh, how funny. Um, Well, well, well. because there is this thinking, I think, isn't there, that uh, some people think that Americans have retained Shakespeare in English. There is this, do you know about this? Well, I know that a lot of the vocabulary that we say is an Americanism is original English. Yeah. And it's us that have changed things. Um, yes, just certainly. They use a lot of quaint, what we regard as quite quaint words. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, there, and there's the pronunciation. Um, so we lost the use of pronouncing the R so yeah. strongly. Which, of course, when you think of the way Americans might say car, mm. and I'm not going to attempt an American accent because <laughs> any regional charm, American accent. Charm, charm, alarm in English, but you would sound those R's in American. For, yeah, much more harshly. Um. I yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're much better at American accent. Well, I think I. it comes from the West Country, arm, because in England we still say arm, don't well, they? Maybe, <laughs> but it's called roticity. Oh, is it? I didn't you looked it. it up. I looked it up because I was fascinated by this, this thing that people said about uh, Americans maintaining Shakespeare in English, which isn't quite true. But there are some of these words and sounds that they kept that we lost. And this idea of roticity is the pronunciation of the word R. And what happened in the UK was there was a period of time when we started losing that. So we, too, used to pronounce our R's mm. very strongly. Right. And then gradually it was phased out. But it got phased out after the British left to go to the New World. Right. So they took with them the old way in which we pronounce ours. So there is definitely, and it happened in Canada as well. There were parts of Canada that still have this strong way of pronouncing ours. But yes, called reticity. There you go. But I I just wanted to throw this in there because it was just a nice general comment. And it just, it's one of those comments that just got me away, beavering away, doing a bit of research. And I really like those kind of comments. Yeah, I I agree. And of course, language is is fascinating. Mm. And there there can be quite a bit of snobbishness on the English side about we we do it properly, everybody else does it wrong, you know. And it's quite fun, you know, and we we say it ourselves sometimes, but in jest, this it isn't true at all as you've just found out. And language is a hugely movable thing. It's it's evolving all of the time. So there's no wrong and right way about any of it. Same with spelling. I know that in America they change a lot of the, the spelling to simplify it because we've got all these anachronisms in the UK of how to spell things and they said, right, sod all that, we're going to make it much more phonetic, make it s- spelt the way it sounds and that, mm-hmm. you know, all of that's the same makes same thing, isn't it? It does make sense. Yes, anyway, so here we are in our strange way I still think it is, it is pronounced boy and not buoy though. <laughs> and al- aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> I love to sit down with American friends and take the piss. Both sides, constantly all night. It's great fun. Oh, and it is football, not soccer. (laughs) 
Although no, so soccer not. soccer is a British word. I know. It's See, when I was a very, very small, I remember soccer being used. Yeah. We used to talk about soccer. So. Well, it, it came about to differentiate it from um, rugby football because, of course, rugby was also called football. It was called rugby football. Mm -hmm. And then football came along. The real football, you know, the one with the round ball that you kick with your feet. Um, and then somewhere along the line, they came up with the Soccer Federation. I can't remember what it stands for. But I uh, think you're making half of this up. No. Nope, I nope, bet you nope, football I've, was around before rugby. I have heard this. Oh, no, no. The game, the game yeah. of football has been around longer than rugby. Yes, OK. But what happened was rugby... For, oh, I don't know. This is, <laughs> this is one of those table, table of bollocks yes. conversations. We are actually being the thing that we Take joke about. Of, yes. The table of bollocks. Well, I don't think we've ever said that this isn't the table of bollocks, have we? <laughs> this is the table of bollocks. <laughs> it is. It's normally you bollocking me. No, it's you bollocking on. <laughs> Enough of all that. So I just want to go back to yes, the threads that seem to exercise people. Clearly, as I was saying earlier, the selling of Esper mm -hmm. was a thread. There's a bit of a throwaway remark from the week before that we developed somewhat. Uh, not that we're selling Esper, but, you know, what has happened now is that people are saying, uh, well, first of all, Mark De Dearman, I'm afraid selling the boat is non-negotiable. I have been watching these for years. Stay safe, guys. So mm. that was one of the examples of the people saying, no, no, don't sell. But we got things from people like Zeb who said, so would you replace it? And if so, with what? You know, when people ask me those questions, I go off on a little flight of fancy. Mm, what would I do? What would I do? And then a couple of people on catamarans, Travelling Wilbury, who left the very first comment under the video, said, don't you guys dare, unless you are trading up to a catamaran, of course. Up? <laughs> trading up to a catamaran? What are you talking about? He was swiftly followed by Random Sandwich, yes. who said, if you were to sell Esper, would you consider a cat or stick with a mono hull? So I think that's a really big subject. They weren't the only two. There were lots of people yes. who said that. What do you think? I, do you know, I think I say this almost every week now yeah. and I frequently say it in response to questions and I frequently say it to you and that is never say never and it applies to so many things that we do so many decisions we make the way our lives you know go down different avenues and paths and I think it's very important to say never say never because you just don't know what's around the corner. Someone could come along and say, here's a 46 foot catamaran. I'm going to give it to you for 50 quid. Would you turn it down? Well, no, but I'd probably sell it and buy a mono. <laughs> I know where I stand. My heart is in monos, yes. of course. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. But, um, you know, really, I hate catamarans because they go so much bloody faster than, <laughs> than monos. There's lots of really good things about cats. The thing I like best is all the space, mm -hmm. um, and they're good for being at anchor. Um, Are they? Well, because, apparently because they don't tip around like no, we do. No, that's not true. I remember moving from Esper at anchor to go and have a chat with someone on their catamaran at anchor, on the same anchorage, mm. and his boat was more uncomfortable than ours. Okay. Because okay. of the way it was moving. All right, that's not what they say, is it? No, it's not, but All right. I disagree with that. I think maybe when we get really old and retire, we want something safe and stable, maybe a catamaran. Well, I think it depends on where you plan to cruise to, the kind of distances you're looking to do. And let's face it, you know, if you've got the marina fees, which yeah. double almost. Yeah. With and cats are expensive anyway in the first place. To be honest, I don't think we'd be in a position to buy one no. unless we had a windfall. So they can't, you know, so in some ways they're out of the question anyway. I do much prefer the look and feel of a mono. Um, but I agree with you, never say never. And I like to say, keep your options open. I like to make a decision, but with a little back door, keeping my options open. Mm. So my decision would be no, not going to buy a cat. But who knows, something might turn up and change my mind. That's the same way of saying never say never. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what was quite interesting. So due to COVID, boats are like gold and priced accordingly here mm. in Australia, a real seller's market. And that was from Nigel, Nigel Palethorpe. You would have no trouble selling, but getting another suitable craft may be the cause of considerable regret. I think, uh, and there were a few comments along those lines. Were there? Yes. And going back to Salty Lass, actually, I think they said uh, something similar. Um, oh, I know Salty Lass said, 
you don't want to come and live over here. It's bloody well. cold, wet, dark. Brexit. Yeah, there was... All the issues relating to Brexit. And yes, no, they, they are right. Yes, yeah, so and hang on, before you continue on that, just want to say on Brexit, we're not saying the political side of it, we're just saying how it's impact, impacted us on a boat. Correct. So pre-Brexit, we could go to the Mediterranean and stay there forever. In all of those countries, it was never, never a problem. And it was fantastic. But now, because the UK is no longer part of Europe, we're just like any other foreign boats, and we mm. don't have that great ability anymore. That's right. Yes, I think we gave the impression, because I had said I wanted to go back and see the family, mm. that we were suggesting we were going to go back to the UK. Mm. Um, and that's not the case. It was just to be somewhere closer. Someone came up with the idea of uh, buying in Mexico, where labour would be cheap, cost of living is cheap. It was Mark Lawrence Kiefer. Mm. Shall I read it out? Go on. He wrote, if you got a really good offer for Esper in Japan, you could take the money and then buy a boat in Mexico or Central America to overhaul there. You would be back in warm weather and the cost of labour isn't horrible. If you bought a boat in the US, the labour cost is horrible. Mm. He, you know, so, yeah, I mean, that's one... <laughs> That's one of the reasons I like this part of the world. I mean, there are lots of reasons why I love Southeast Asia. I can't imagine many other places I'd want to be other than here. The cost of labour is very reasonable and we can get everything done here. We've done it before, we know how to do it. Anyway, yeah, any, anything else you want to say, particularly on that? Because I have got other things to say on monopolising. No, but I think it goes to show that not only are we being open to ideas, and that's how we bought the boat, but I also wanted to say that if you are looking to buy a boat, to be open to mm. the possibility of starting your new life on the, other, on the other side of the world. Go where the boat is, yes. find the boat of your dreams, move on to it, and then deal with being in a new environment. Yes, which is what we did, for those that mm. don't know. So we're from the UK and we bought our boat. She was in Turkey. Mm -hmm. We moved out to Turkey and did everything in Turkey and got used to it there. But we looked as far as the Caribbean, yep. all over Europe, all over the UK, until we found the boat that we knew that we wanted. And you do know, immediately you get on the boat, that it's the boat you want. So yes, I, I think the whole this whole throwaway comment has been very, very interesting. And you and I talked a little bit about it on Passage this week, about what we want to do. We still don't know what we want to do. I don't want to go back to the UK. I just don't want to be cold. We need to be somewhere that we can fly from to the UK easily so that you can get back when you want. So that, you know, Southeast Asia is pretty good for that. It's very easy. There's so many flights back to London from here. Under, under normal circumstances, not yes, right now, no. under normal circumstances. Yeah. And, it, and it's quite cheap as well. It does work out quite yes. cheap. Also, Central America will be good for that as well, because actually most places you can get to London. Mexico, you can fly to Mexico direct, yeah. I think. And um, yeah, the flight isn't much further, yeah. not that much further than flying to New York from London. Um, OK, add on a couple of extra miles. I mean, in comparison, uh, to say flying back to the UK from Japan or, or Australia, you know, they are that much further mm. away. Yeah, Singapore and KL here are just, there's a, like a flight every five minutes or so right, many. Yeah, yeah so uh, I think that, you know, if we were in a position to buy, we'd feel very happy about all the places we could go to to buy a boat. What we need is an Australian to come over here and buy Esper. And then that gives us the opportunity to start looking. And the other major thing that we've talked about this week while we've been sailing is what we would do, you know, with this boat that we're going to buy that you want to do up. There's lots of things we've got in, in loads of things we do. It w and it would be a boat that we would have, we would want to renovate completely, wouldn't it? Mm. Are you two minds about that? About? Whether we would buy an old boat to do Oh, up. no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it would partly be because of our budget. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, there's two ways of buying a boat. The first is that you spend all your money on a decent boat, and that's it. You don't spend any more money. Well, we can't do that. So it's better to spend little bits each month and do that. And that's how we did the refit. You know, each month we had a budget 
for, for the work that, that we were paying for that was spread out over a year or so mm. because that's how our budget works. You know, small monthly income allowed us to do that. And, and I think that's how a refit would work was that you'd buy a, a cheaper shell mm. and then over a period of many, many months, mm. you would slowly do it up as your income allowed you to. And we did agree, didn't we, that any second-hand boat, I mean, perhaps not one that's only a couple of years old, but most second-hand boats, you're probably going to have to change everything. All the sails, the rigging, the standing rigging, all the electronics. Engine, perhaps. Engine, yes. even. Actually, if, everything. Uh, one of our supporters, I'm not going to mention his name, and I'm not going to mention what he spotted, because I want him to, I want him to buy this boat. But he has found a boat mm. which was so ridiculously oh, yes. cheap... We'd have bought it. That we would have bought it, yeah. definitely. So Buy it. I, I'm hoping that he will. But what I did say to him was, that is so cheap, there has to be a reason why it's so cheap. And you need to identify why it's so cheap. Maybe it's been in an accident and uh, they've done a quick repair job on the hull that you can't see when the boat's in the water. Mm. Uh, perhaps the engine is literally about to shit itself and needs a, a, a new engine. Uh, I don't know, but... Yeah, just be very careful when you come across boats that appear to be so cheap, it's an absolute bargain. There There's is normally a reason. a reason. And if it's been in an accident, that doesn't mean to say it's a no-no, it just means you can reduce the price even further and then rebuild it. That's right. Yeah, all good. We did also talk about pilot books. Yes, and, we did. Um, Ted, now, Ted Sherrin, Ted is another supporter of ours, yeah. and he's also a keen sailor as well. But he said, excuse the stupid question, but what's a pilot guide? Is that the same as cruising guides for different areas? And it got me thinking, you know, it surprised me that Ted asked this question because I thought a pilot guide was a universal word that everyone knew. And, you know, here's a sailor who hadn't heard the term before. And it just got me thinking about these podcasts because not everyone who listens to our podcast is a sailor. Mm. Perhaps people are listening to it for the travel aspect or just to hear us bollock on about rubbish. I think we've got to be a bit careful about terminology we use because yeah. we're probably saying things that people don't understand what on earth we're talking about. Oh, we're probably getting it wrong some of the time as well. You oh, know. most of the time. Yeah, so I it's think. great that people correct us. Yes. I actually answered that. I don't know if you saw my reply. I did see it, yeah. Because I thought that a pilot guide was an official admiralty guide. This is what I thought in my head. I also thought that it had a lot more detail for each of the anchorages. And then I thought about some of the cruising guides and thought, mm, actually, no, they, they've got all of that as well. And I looked it up and couldn't come to a conclusion. So did you find out the answer? I didn't. No. Not, not on that specific one. I was no. thinking just more generally yeah. that there are probably... If you are listening to this or watching this, then there are terminologies that we're using, words that you have no idea what they are. That's why when I mentioned the rope stripper, to mm. explain what it is, because to a lot of non-sailors, they're not going to know what these things are. So yes. I think we need to be mindful of that. Okay. So one of the big things is yacht. Oh, yeah. Go on. Yeah, go, on. <laughs> go on. What's a yacht? Well, in, in the UK, what we have here, Esper, she's a yacht. Correct. She's just known as a yacht. Mm. Also, over here in Southeast Asia, these sailboats, for want of a better term, and the better term is yacht. Yacht. <laughs> or that is the English term, but the American term, they don't seem to like it. They much prefer sailboat. So we use both in our descriptions because we have a lot of uh, Americans who, who watch and listen to us. So... And liverboard is another one. Yes. Liverboard is a, it's a very... British term to mean what we're doing, cruisers. In, in the States, a liverboard, there is a liverboard, but they're a, quite a different beast. They're normally people that just live on a boat as an alternative way of, uh, to yes. living on land. Tend not to sail. Correct. Tend to be sort of more like a houseboat. A houseboat. Permanently yeah. moored somewhere. That's but, right. So. And that's caused some confusion yeah. uh, in some of the comments we've yeah. received in the past. So, yeah, so we'll say liverboard in America, they're so cruiser. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So when we say, we, we stopped saying yacht because we got so fed up with trying to explain to people that we weren't being posh or trying to be arrogant. <laughs> it's just that's what we say in the UK. It just means a boat. <laughs> it's just a boat. It's got sails, it's got flappy bits. So, yes, it's a sailboat, but it's also a yacht. You mm. get sailing yachts and motor yachts, you know, and it's super yachts, small yachts, white yachts, black yachts, all of those. 
terminology. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm rabbiting on. A couple so, of other things, yeah, by the, sorry, just a couple of other things I got, I, I got wrong or didn't describe. I oh, think in the I... video, or maybe in the last podcast, I talked about RX8 cables and 256 connectors. Oh, right, sure. And I knew immediately afterwards I got it wrong. It is mm. RG8, oh. and then you can get RG8 XORU, which I did explain in the video. And I think the connectors are 259, not 256. And again, this is one of the problems with doing podcasts is yes. that we gab on and sometimes yeah. don't think about what we're saying. Yes, so. it's good to correct it, though, because yes. uh, I gather some people are watching these things and trying to learn from them. So let's get the, let's try and get it right as much as we can. It's good that we've got people out there who not only know that I'm using the wrong terminology, but can come back with some experience. <laughs> well, that's always been the case with Follow the Boat. We've had amazing comments over the years from um, supporters and followers. Mm. Um, we've learned as much, probably, from the people who watch our videos as they have from us. So it's a two-way thing, as is this podcast. I think it's time to wrap up now. OK, are you going to tell us what you're going to do the rest of the day? Well, what I would love to do is to put my trunks on and cool off in this water here but I know I won't be because instead I will once again be getting the podcast video edited I suppose.